get warned that something is in, in the area. They have all have a very, very uh, powerful sense of smell. And then the second uh, most powerful sense they have is the feeling, the vibration on their lateral line. Uh, and we want to make sure that we uh, appeal to that because in dirty water, remember, we know for a fact that walleyes need to see their see their prey to eat it. That's why fishing in dirty water is tough. So we have to get them turned. They're not like some other predators like bass, pike, muskie that'll just go over and go, I think something's here and suck something in. Uh, walleyes need to kind of see what's happening. So we got to get them turned and we got to get them to know that our bait's in the area. So we do that. Again, the two most powerful senses are smell and vibration or lateral line. Uh, in dirty water, it's essential to attract fish to presentation presentation by using these senses, right? So uh, it's important all the time to appeal to these senses, but it really is a big deal as the water starts to get a little bit dirtier. All right, let's talk a little bit about scent. Um, you guys know I love scent. You know, the cooler the water is, the more I think scent is important. So now you add cold water and you add dirty water and you add inactive fish. we got a problem we really need to, uh, uh, again, appeal to that big sense of smell. Uh, as the water gets dirtier, make it really stinky, really stinky. Um, you know, scent can be, uh, there's some scents that are just a masking agent. There are some scents that kind of imitate live bait. Uh, and those are great in clear water. When the water gets dirty, you want your bait to stink and you want it to stink a long way away. Um, Dirty water, I had sent to lures and even live bait. If I was going to put a minnow on a jig or maybe I was trolling a crawler harness in dirty water, I would still put scent even on live bait just to give it that little extra, uh, that little extra bling, if you will. Um, reply, reapply often. Don't be afraid to put too much. I don't think, I don't think in dirty water there's too much scent. Um, I don't think you can do that. I think that that's just one of those things that, um, again, we're trying to get those fish uh, pulled in, at least know that our bait is there. Uh, when it gets dirty and it gets, and you need stinky, my favorite, and, you know, I'm a Procure guy, you guys know that. Uh, I love the garlic nightcrawler. And this thing just sitting here in the studio, I mean, you open the studio door, you can actually smell it. It's that nasty. Um, but that's what you want. That's what you want in dirty water. You want something really stinky. So don't be afraid to apply it every 10, 15 minutes. You pull a crankbait in to retune it uh, or you catch fish, put some more on there, right? Um, guys, have talked a lot about Procure. I don't want to go too far off topic, but you know, I carry a little Tupperware uh, container with a top, a little shallow con Tupperware container with a top, a little small bottle of white ivory soap and a toothbrush. At the end of the day, when I take my baits off that have Procure, I sit them in there, let them sit for a little bit in some water, a little bit of white ivory dish soap. I hit them with a the toothbrush, get all that stuff off and rinse them off in clean water and put them back in my tackle box. So very easy to take care of. I see uh, our good buddy, Mark is here. He's down in Erie. I know Mark's a big scent guy. Um, Mark's a Dr. Juice guy, but I also know that Mark is a big scent guy and I would bet you dollars to donuts he's uh, running some scent on some of his baits uh, this time of year down in Erie dealing with that cold water uh, and fish that don't want to bite. And he was talking about dirty water the other day. We talked last week about water color, water clarity. Mark Mark made a nice post. He says, I'm marking fish in all the water. He says, but I'm only catching fish in the green water. So pretty cool. So I like a really, really stinky scent, and I just keep putting it on there and keep putting it on there and keep putting it on there. All right? All right, sound. We've talked about sound a lot, and I'm a huge believer uh, in sound. You, you guys know that. Um, but again, just like smell, the dirtier the water is, make it really noisy. There are times that a bait that makes a little bit of noise is good. In dirty water, it's got to be stinky. Absolutely has to be, or it has to be loud. It has to be loud. Remember, the lateral line picks up low frequency. So fish feel low frequency sounds at their lateral line, uh, and they can feel it from a pretty good distance away. 25, 30, sometimes, some, you know, 30, 35 feet is kind of the outside range of that. So we're going to use the scent to get them headed over that way. Then they're going to feel that bait. Um, uh, through their lateral line, and that's where that low frequency vibration comes in. Pick lures that make low frequency sounds, uh, and that is, I don't know if you can hear this or not, but right, those are baits with one or two big bearings uh, in them, baits that, you know, I call the thud or a thunk, right? Uh, so that's a bandit. This is a P10. Uh, P10's top 20s have that. Uh, I, I went back and grabbed some old baits that we used to catch a lot of fish on that we don't use anymore. I started using last year again. This is a, a thunder stick, right? That has that low frequency sound. So as I go through all these baits that I've used for years and they work, 
they all have a low frequency sound. So um, that's a big deal. And I will tell you this, as you're picking baits, especially crank baits for uh, this time of year, uh, plastic bodies are gonna be better than wood bodies. Wood bodies usually don't have any sound in them. Uh, if you're casting this time of year, or maybe you're fishing from shore, uh, or you're fishing from shallower lakes, don't forget lures like a clacking wrap, not a rattling wrap, because a rattling wrap has a bunch of small BBs. The clacking wrap makes a low frequency sound. It has one or two small BBs in it. So the clacking wrap has a low frequency sound. The rattling wrap has a higher frequency sound. So um, it's important to get the right one. Now, if I'm fishing jigs, I don't care how shell I'm fishing. If the water gets dirty, I do a couple things, big jigs. Um, I carry some ounce and a quarter in the boat. If it gets really dirty, I want to pound that bottom. I want to boom, 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 bang that bottom. So, you know, three quarter ounce, one ounce, ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half, even if you had, I know Mark's got some ounce and a half in his boat. The, the, um, uh, the, um, Dirtier the water is, the bigger the jig needs to be, even in shallow water because you're making noise. The bigger your body needs to be, right? Um, you know, make sure your body has a twister tail on it. Make sure it has a big boot tail or paddle tail on it. Those work. Um, I know a lot of guys in some of the rivers, we, we don't do it a lot here, and I don't know why. Um, I need to add some to my box. I have a bunch. But I know there's a lot of guys in um, Mississippi River. Missouri River that when the water gets dirty, they put on like a six or seven inch lizard, like a bass fishing uh, rubber lizard with all the legs and the big massive body. But, um, you know, I like our, our disc worm. Uh, I like that little boot tail that um, uh, the big bite um, cane thumper that's got that big paddle tail, big old, just old style Mr. Twister shad bodies. Anything that makes a lot of noise and has a lot of mass uh, is important to, uh, to have. If you're going to fish um, uh, collar harnesses in dirty water, um, obviously something we're not really doing right now, but as the summer goes on, um, if you want to pull harnesses, big blades, um, you know, and big in dirty water, you know, you want Colorado blades. They have the most vibration. And I'm talking big. I'm talking sixes, sevens, and eights, uh, even for walleyes, right? Because, um, you know, thud, 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 making that that low frequency vibration uh, as they go through. I remember Colorado blades make the most vibration. So that's kind of what we want to do. So we're, we're appealing to those two uh, senses that these fish have. Again, um, sound and um, smell. Those are the two that we want to make sure that we are appealing to. Um, as we deal with dirty water. All right, any questions on that? Any comments on that? Anything that you guys do uh, in dirty water? You know, remember too, as we talk about, you know, we talked about sight and sound or sound and smell here, but remember as the water gets dirtier, your bait needs to get closer to the fish. That's a big deal too. Your strike zone definitely decreases. Your bait needs to get a little bit closer to the fish for them to obviously smell it, feel it, and be able to uh, actually hit it. Gary says uh, he runs Dr. Juice. Uh, I know Mark's a Dr. Juice guy, but I, you know, I, I don't really care what scent you use. There's lots of good ones out there. Um, just make sure you use it. Mark said he's 100% using scent right now. Uh, he's done on Erie guiding. So, you know, I know that's that's a big thing. And again, the colder the water is, the more uh, scent we use. The, the, the colder the water, more scent. The dirtier the water, more scent. You combine the two you should have some scent product on there <laughs> um, for sure, right? And again, a scent product that really smells. We're not we're not trying just to mask, like sometimes we do in summertime, we'll use a scent that just kind of mask bad odors. Um, but um, uh, as summer goes on, we can get, you know, as the water stays decent, um, we can kind of, um, you know, go to different types of scents, maybe scents that imitate shad or shiners, you know, actually, I'm going to call it real smells. Um, but in dirty water, you want stinky. Um, it needs to be annoyingly stinky. That's why I love the garlic nightcrawler, because it is annoyingly stinky. <laughs> um, so again, I use it on live bait. And if I'm going to put a minnow on a jig, I still put scent on. So um, I think that is a big, um, uh, a big deal. So I think that's some, I think some guys don't, don't mess with, you know, it, it is messy. It is, it does take a little bit of extra to put a squirt on there, but, um, I would tell you it definitely makes a difference. Ron says the old Whistler jig from Northland. Absolutely. That I still have boxes 
um, uh, of Whistler jigs. I used to fish a lot of Whistler jigs when the water got dirty. Whistler jig is a uh, jig, actually kind of, the, the jig head's kind of shaped like our jig head a little bit, um, but it had a metal propeller behind the head. When you lift it, you could actually feel the propeller turn and it would make vibration. It would make noise. Uh, I used to carry a lot of, and I still do, I don't use them a lot anymore, um, but I used to uh, use them a lot and I carry them. Um, Northland makes, it's called a buckshot rattle. It's got a little rubber ring to go over the collar of your jig. It's a little tube and it's got two great big BBs in it. One that's stationary and one that moves. And it makes, as you lift your jig, it makes a noise. Um, those little spinner blades, Northland Tackle makes a little spinner blade that slides on to your uh, jig and a little rubber, you know, rubber circle that goes over the collar. Um, they're awesome. Yeah, I, I would definitely tell you put some Whistler, Whistler jigs in your box. Um, again, a good shape. They're, they're they're really close to the shape of our jig. Um, you know, I and I have a whole box of them. I have them from I think three eighths all the way up to one ounce. Um, fish them. Used to fish them a lot. So yeah, anything that makes a little bit of noise, uh, a little spinner blade on your jig, the uh, buckshot rattles. Um, those were those used to be my favorites when I used to fish just um, a plain jig with a minnow. I'd put a buckshot rattle uh, on on there and make a little bit of noise. So anything you can do to make noise and create smell is a good deal, right? Scent impregnated plastics are good, but then I'd still would put in dirty water. I still would put a scent product on it also. So um, whatever you guys like, there's lots of great scents out there. Put it on there and get it stinky. Kevin says Whistler jig uh, they use on the Columbia. Yeah, yep. Um, uh, Joe says uh, judges jaw jackers put rattles in their plastics. That's a great idea. Uh, I know uh, we've got some bass fishermen watching. I know that uh, tonight. Um, you know, a lot of companies in the bass world actually make um, rattles that you can insert in plastics. Um, you know, they go in, you can actually pull them out and put them back in the, ne the next plastic. You're going to use little rattle chambers that actually go inside your plastic bodies. Um, so there's all kinds of, all kinds of ways to do this. Um, so there you go. Uh, Wayne says you feel glow baits to be better in dirty water. I'm not against glow, uh, in, uh, in dirty water. Absolutely. Uh, I'm definitely not against, uh, against glow and dirty water. I think that's that's another. Again, it's just something that lets the fish see your bait. Now, I don't like a lot of glow, right? So if I'm going to use a glow jig, uh, I'm going to you know I'm going to have a glow base. And and our uh, we when we get them back on the market here, uh, we have the glow orange, the glow clown, and the glow. I don't remember what we call it, but it's glow with the blue top. We 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 have three jigs with glow on them and we cover it with other stuff so it's just a little bit of glow i think you can get too much glow um same thing with crankbaits right if you feel you need some glow um a little piece of glow tape a little piece of glow paint maybe a couple eyes maybe one or two dots on the bottom of the bait that's all you need just enough um to you don't want your bait to you know create an aura out there because it's glowing like the sun but glow definitely helps it, it's definitely an attractor um Mitch says, it seems that chrome baits with ball bearing would help in dirty water. Actually, chrome baits are probably your worst choice in dirty water because chrome, and to a little lesser extent, gold, actually needs sunlight to flash. If you don't get sunlight, you don't get the, the reflective quality off gold uh, and silver. So my favorite colors, I like dark colors in uh, dirty water. I like blacks. I like purples. Um, uh, I like blacks. I like purples. Um, I like uh, coppers. If I'm going to go metallic, I like coppers, but I really stay away from uh, from uh, silvers and golds because you don't get the flash off of them because you don't get um, uh, you don't get without the sunlight you don't get anything there. Um, so yeah, silver is not your best. Not your chrome silver, not your best. Gold is not your best. If you want to do, if you want something metallic, stick with. Um, uh, uh, copper, but again, in, in dirty water, my favorite baits are, um, you know, black, purple. Mark says plain lead on the jigs. Um, I, there's just something about that. Sometimes you can get too much. So, um, you know, just, just kind of be be aware of that. Uh, Mark says, do you apply scent to the whole bait or just the bill? Uh, I'll actually put a squirt on the bottom right along the belly. I'll just kind of just a little squirt right there. Um, kind of in between the two hooks, and that's usually good enough to hold for a little bit. Um, you know, uh, if I'm doing it on plastics, I'll put a squirt along the hole 
edge of the plastic um, and load it up pretty good. And again, I like the disc worm for doing that um, because that disc worm has, as does the cane thumper, um, has ribs on it so that 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 stuff stays on it. You know, you take a like our worm that's just a, a you know a flat side uh, with nothing to hold it. It doesn't stay on there good. But these disc worms and the um, uh, I took it to, I took it to DWF last night. So I don't have it on the desk. But the cane thumper has ridges on it. The cane thumper actually has a little hook cut out um that's designed for you know a jig a, a, a texas rig hook to come out but it's got a little pocket in there you can actually boop, boop, put a little squirt in there um and call it good dave says he uses a, a clear glow overcoat uh, sure I'm, I'm definitely not against glow i just don't like too much glow i think sometimes you can overdo um overdo the glow so um you know make sure it glows if you like that but just make sure it's not a tr obtrusive just really <laughs> too much. Okay. All right. Anything else on scent and sound before we kind of roll on to the next little fun topic I wanted to talk about tonight? Anything else? Anybody got anything else they want to chat about? Or any questions or comments about uh, scent or sound? Hope that kind of gave you a good idea. And again, if you go to the teachefishing.com, click on the Coffee Hour Plus little box at the middle of the page. You can get tonight's uh, study stuff and have it. Uh, Roy says he's used set on a rib type bait in the Procure State on Detroit River for about three hours. Absolutely. Uh, Black Mamba. There you go. Yeah, uh, the thing I like, you know, one of the things I like about the Procure, especially the uh, Super Gel, is it's pretty sticky. It, it's it's pretty it's pretty sticky. Uh, Jerick says when you're talking about dirty water, you're talking about brown, not green. Actually, you can get dirty green water. If you can't see your cavitation plate, that water is dirty. Okay. So that's, that's what it is. If you can't see your cavitation plate, we consider that dirty water. So you could actually have dirty green water. Obviously brown is going to be dirty most of the time, but you can have dirty green water. Absolutely. I have not tried Z-Man. Um, you know, I kind of stick to my plastics. Um, you know, there you go. Jeff says, what about Anis? It was an old scent. Anis is stinky. Um, you know, that was, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember we were, we, I used to do, uh, used to do some carp fishing. My mom used to play golf on Tuesdays and me and a buddy would go carp fish at the golf course. And I remember we, we would make our own dough balls. And I remember going to Myers one night asking for anise oil. The guys were looking at us like we were crazy. So yeah, anise is, you know, kind of a licorice scent. That's, that's an old original, um, scent, um, and still works. Absolutely still works. And, uh, Procure makes a straight anise scent. They, they make an anise scent. So there you go. Uh, Jamie says, where can I find a video on how to tie your stinger hook slip knot? I don't know that you can anymore. So we're going to have to maybe redo that. So, okay. All right. Let's take a, uh, just a quick few minutes. Again, remember, get head over to teachingfishing.com website. Click on the public lounge. Lots of really cool videos there. Um, if you're not a member, check out the Teaching Fish and Anglers Club. See what it's all about. We'd love to have you um, there. We've got the DVD to stream. Uh, lots of cool things coming up. So. Um, there you go. Uh, races, tie flyer supplies have a glass rattle that can be epoxy to a jig. I like that. Um, perfect on Hubbard Lake. Nice. How many Procure scents is there? Uh, there's a whole bunch. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I like the garlic nightcrawler. Um, again, for stinky stuff, uh, if I'm fishing close to the bottom, I like the garlic nightcrawler. Um, if I'm fishing up in the middle of the water column, you know, especially as the water gets a little cleaner. Um, you know, I like the I like the Emerald Shiner. I like the Shad. Um, I like the smelt in deeper water. So as I've come off the bottom and the water is, you know, is fishable, it's clear uh, or clean. Let's call it that way, uh, stained or clear. As I come off the bottom, I try to imitate what the fish are biting on. I get closer to the bottom. I want something that smells. So I like, I probably use more garlic night color than anything. That's probably my number one deal and there's a link right there to the uh procure home site yeah emerald shiner is awesome uh rattle beads on your crawler harness absolutely uh matt i didn't know about this he says they make anna scented beads for steelhead that could work too absolutely especially if they're soft and you can slide one right over your jig so perfect uh how often should you reapply generally speaking procure probably you know ever on a, on a on a hard bait uh a crankbait probably every half hour right um somewhere in there um on a plastic bait probably every hour hour and a half 
you know, you when you pull it out and you can't smell it, put some more on because because you can smell that stuff. So there you go. Uh, what's my opinion on Procure Trophy Walleye? It's one of the scents I always have in the boat. So there you go. So all right, let's wrap this up. Uh, let's go on to our fun topic for tonight. So here is my fun topic for tonight. Uh, I've been talking the last couple of days with some guys about what we do and kind of teaching and sometimes how frustrating it can be. So I want to ask you guys, because one of the things I think that, that, that uh, I'm starting to realize is before I can teach some of you some things, and same with me when I try to learn, I have to unlearn some bad habits that I have. Uh, and what comes to mind right away is, you know, rod tips in the air, which is terrible, right? A rod tip should never be up in the air. The higher your rod goes in the air, the less of the rod you're using to fight the fish, the less chance you have of controlling the fish. And if a fish comes at you, you get slack, you got nowhere to go to get it. Rod tips in the air are terrible. That's what kind of created this whole thing. So what is the one thing that you do in fishing that you know probably isn't right, but you are having a hard time to unlearn. What is what is the thing that you go? Huh, I ah, I find myself doing this. You know, my grandpa taught me, my uncle taught me, my dad taught me. It's hard to break this habit. What is the the one habit that you have that you are trying to break? That's I'd like to have that little conversation uh, again. For me, I, I know most of the the people that I. Uh, talk to or see in the boat, it's high rod tips. And high rod tips absolutely drive me bonkers. Um, Todd says, drag too tight. Yeah, keeping a tight drag. I I keep a fairly tight drag uh, on the river. I set my drag just tight enough that I can, it takes a little bit of pressure to pull a line out. Um, I, I keep a very, very tight drag when I am trolling. Uh, a lot tighter than a lot of guys. So you got to really pull my reels. Because again, walleyes can't swim backwards. I, where are they going to go? And, and one of those, <laughs> nice one, <laughs> nice one. Um, you know, you know where our walleye is going to go. You can always bet. You know, there, there's no reason to let a three, four, five pound, six pound walleye open water control you. It's just put the rod and just crank. He ain't going anywhere. Forget about the. He's not going anywhere. Right, I think a little bigger, maybe a little softer hands. Uh, and I'm not a drag guy. Even with line counters, I'm an open the spool thumb them, close the spool, and start cranking again. I, I'm not a big drag guy at all. Um, if I get a walleye on the river that I think is is a big fish, and I reverse swish off and I back reel, that way I have complete control of how much line he takes. So um, I, I keep my drags pretty tight, and if I need to drag, I want to do it myself. So uh, Jason says his habit is always fishing favorite baits and colors. Uh, I like that. Not watching electronics close enough. That's a big one. That's a huge one there. Uh, Dale says, go to a spot or a memory over actually finding fish. Those two kind of go hand in hand, right? You you have spots or memories. If you're keeping good records, there's reasons you should be going there. But then you do have to make sure the fish are there before you do that. Uh, John says, not changing presentation enough. Uh, fishing memories, fishing memories. <laughs> Uh, I like that, right? But again, there is there is something about using old data to get a start, but then you have to work from there. So um, I don't know if that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you just go to memories and fish it without looking for fish. That's a bad thing. Uh, Dave says, hot tips, usually a lie. <laughs> Need to spend the time to look. Yeah, don't get sucked into there's, you know, 20 boats over there because now you roll in there's 21 guys not catching any fish. So that's usually how that works. Um, Tommy says, stay on my favorite spot too long if it's not producing. Um, Ron says, wait too long to set the hook. Um, that can be good or bad, right? If you're jig fishing, obviously it needs to be instantly. Um, you know, if you're trolling, I like to let my board kind of set back and let the board actually do the work. So Emma says, don't listen for the hot tip. Become the hot tip. I like that. Um, oh, here's one. Fishing inactive fish because I don't want to leave fish to find fish. Why not, Jimmy? Why do you not want to leave? Why? What What makes you stay there? Uh, Gary says, only trying a new tactic and then go back quickly to what I've always done. Um, Bob says, not changing up lures. We talked about that, Gary. We talked about that uh, last night at DWF. I, I did a presentation on uh, different rods, reels, line combinations we need for fishing. And we talked about fishing a short, stiff fishing rod for jig fishing, which I will go to my grave telling you that you will catch more fish with a five and a half foot medium heavy rod 
vertical jigging than you ever will with anything else if you learn how to use it properly. The problem is too many guys, they buy a rod, ours or somebody else's, they buy a five and a half foot medium heavy, they fish it for an hour and they pull their old rod out and go fishing. They don't give it enough time. The other thing they do, to speak to your point, is they fish the same way, right? The way you jig with a six and a half foot ugly stick, you can't jig like that with a short stiff fishing rod, right? You take a, a I see a lot of these guys with these with these soft medium action Fenwicks or you know pick one. Well, it doesn't really matter, right? Just pick one, and they're you know they're doing this when they're jigging. Well, you're doing this. That jig doesn't move until that rod loads up. So even though you're doing this, that jig's only moving like that. So you can take a short stiff jigging rod and you can physically move the jig the whole time. And it's moving the same amount of time. Problem is, guys do this with a soft action fishing rod, and the bait the jig's only going this far, right? It's not snapping; it's only going like this. The problem is, they take a short stiff fishing rod and they do that, and that jig flies out the water because it comes up twelve feet because the rod's so stiff. So, buying the right equipment, you know, we've talked about this a lot. If you're going to learn a technique, so whatever it is, so you know, maybe you want to learn how to troll spoons on lead core. If that's your true I'm trying to find Gary. There's Gary. If that's your true reason for being on the water that day, to learn how to run spoons and lead core, the only thing you should have in your boat is spoons and lead core. Because if you have your old reliable, the minute that that other thing doesn't work, you're going to go back to doing, like Gary says, what you've done. So if you want to get good at this, if you want to try a new rod and reel setup, you got to leave your other stuff at home. You got to just fish with that and learn how to do it. If you want to learn a new technique, you have to just take that technique. That's an important part of this process. And again, that day you're going to waste learning a new technique or how to fish a new rod, the day you waste is going to catch you more fish in the long run than using that day to actually catch some fish. So there you go. Uh, races, we all need to keep creating a bigger bag of tricks. I believe that 100%. <laughs> Matt says buying more baits I don't need. Nah, I think we're all... <laughs> I, I think I think we're I think we're all into that. Todd says, but longer rod, faster hook set. Not when you're vertical jigging, it's not. Definitely not. Longer the rod is, the more it has to load up. Um, in a rod holder trolling, I would agree with you. Um, vertical jigging, I will definitely disagree with you. Um, that's the whole deal. Uh, Robert says, going to the bait shop is like Norm walking in. Cheers, Bob. You're here. Uh, Dan says, not using all my electronics all the time. Uh, Downscan, sidescan uh, have been getting a lot better. Uh, he's been getting a lot better with that. That's a big deal, right? Uh, I don't know if you saw Chris Capito's um, post the other day. He, they were on the river a couple hours, didn't catch anything. And then he um, uh, drove around, finds a fish on the side scan and caught a bunch in a short amount of time. It's amazing how much better they bite uh, when you're fishing where they are. Jeez. Uh, Dan says, I left my buddy. I let my buddies pick where to try instead of the sonar unit. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Roy says, I need to stop buying plastics. No, never. Um, so, yeah, I again, you know, it's all, it's all those things, you know, we, we try to teach, but sometimes we have to remember that people have to unlearn what they know. Uh, Kenny says I should spend more time in the big pack of boats because they might just be catching fish. <laughs> I know Kenny's a loner. I see Kenny off by himself quite a bit. He catches a lot of fish, especially on the Detroit River. I know he kind of likes to blaze his own trail. Um, that's a, that's a good that's a good thing. Getting away from you know, look at sometimes you got to fish in the pack. Sometimes that, that, you know sometimes there is a pack there um, because there are fish there. Well, that's part of it, right? But there's a lot of days that the pack is not um the deal right and usually if the pack gets if if i'm in a pack i'm gonna give you a little tip here if i'm in a pack and i see that they are catching fish but it's just too much to fish i'll make a little pass through there with my sonar um find that place on an actual map i don't like to use my chart for that i like a paper map because i've got you know i've got a better picture on a paper map find that spot on a paper map and what i'll do is i'll look for spots just like it and chances are pretty good I can find a couple spots just like it and go catch fish by myself. So duplicating what kind of structure you're fishing or the situation, if you find that somewhere else in the lake or the river, you can probably, those fish are probably biting there too. So if you get in a pack that's too big, try to figure out what's holding the fish there and find another spot just like it, you should be good to go. So, um, 
Uh, Matt says, get a TM50 deucer or upgrade my graph to three and one. Get a TM150. I don't know if Chris McCulley's here tonight, but um, yeah, I would tell you for what you do, Matt, especially on the big lake, that TM150 is going to make a big difference on how many fish you see. That's good. That's a good, that's a good deal. So uh, Scott has made a nice little post here. So check that out if you're interested in helping with the walleye for warriors. All right. What else do you guys do that you know might not be 100% right? Um, but you're having a hard time. Or what, let me ask you this. What have you learned? You're like, man, I'd like to do that. But to do that, I have to stop doing this. What are the things, um, what are some things that you struggle with breaking a habit with? Um, hard habits, or ha you're a hard habit to break, as the song says. <laughs> um, what are some things, that, you know, that you're having a hard time breaking? Uh, you know, I, I know for me, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stubborn, right? I, I am pretty stubborn, especially if something works. I have a tendency sometimes to stay with something too long. Um, just because, right? Um, sometimes when the bite dies, as opposed to reeling stuff in and changing, if the fish are still there, I just keep the old stuff on and I just kind of, you know, I don't always change as fast as um, I should. Part of that is 16 rods in the water. It's kind of hard to, um, you know, to start doing all that, but I, I'm, I'm lazy sometimes. I'll, and I'll, that's the word for it. I'm lazy sometimes. Um, especially when you got 20, 25 fish in the box and you got another hour of the day left. You're like, I don't know. I mean, how many more fish do you need? So sometimes you get a little lazy. That's, that's my biggest bad habit is I have a tendency to get lazy. Um, don't always respond. Now I, I, I really, I'm, go, I'm, I'm, I'm going a hundred mile an hour until I figure it out. But once I figured out some days, I don't go that extra step to really figure it out, right? I may I may get to seven out of ten, and I don't go that extra effort to get ten out of ten. That's some days I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, Evan says fishing lakes. I know not trying new lakes enough. Uh, Jeff says fishing only or mostly in the morning. Um, being more expecting of new technologies and uh, techniques as well as better equipment. That's a, that's a big thing too, right? Is is you know, look at it's fishing's expensive, right? I was talking to a guy the other day. He bought a brand new um, Skeeter boat the other day, and he spent a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. And he called me up and says, "Hey, you know, what would you do to rig this boat?" I said, "What do you want to do?" So he gave me, and I I sent him over a list, and that list was, you know, it was twenty five thousand bucks, right? By the time you add you know, three nine or three 12 inch units and you add uh, structure scan 3D and you add a high quality trolling motor and he wanted active target and he wanted, you know, rod holders. Well, that's a $2,500 or $25,000 bill. He's like, there's no way my wife's going to let me spend <laughs> another another 25,000. And I think that's something, if you're buying a boat, I think that's something you got to be prepared for that um, um, you have to be prepared that the boat is not the boat motor trailer is not your last investment. So be careful with that um, when you're budgeting and when you're, you know, you're working at looking at a total price or you're looking at a payment. Um, understand that you're going to, you know, most boats, it, it's really hard to rig a boat with less than 20 grand. Very hard. So if you got a boat at 60, that bill is going to be 80. And it's a lot easier to put that 20 on the payment, get the payment, you know, $10 a week more. Than it is to come up with 25 grand somewhere along the road to um you know get that stuff so i i, I would encourage you so uh kevin says listening to the wife and coming back early instead of staying out all day <laughs> i got a wife like that too the two times a year she goes fishing as soon as we get our limit we're done that's all she wants to do is get fish for her mom and when we get them we're done but she only goes twice a year so that's good all right what else we got what other habits are you guys into? Let's get this wrapped up here so we can call her a night. Hopefully, you, again, if you um, uh, want to study this, again, you can go to the teachingfishing.com website, scroll down to the Coffee Hour Plus box, click on that, and we've got the study materials uh, available for actually every week that we've done the last couple of weeks. So there you go. Um, Tom says, I need to try speed trolling. There you go. Comfort zone, not above two and a half. Need to work on going three. Love that. I love that. Uh, Paul, this is a good one here. Pitching jigs versus vertical jigging. I'm stubborn. I want to stick uh, the fish vertically, probably because of my confidence in the vertical game. But last year, pitching was very productive. Absolutely was. You know, we talked here uh, in the Detroit River Workshop about how I was 
you know, it's kind of hard with four customers in the boat and, you know, Paul's a captain too. It's kind of hard with yourself and four uh, customers in the boat to cast or pitch jigs. That's tough to do, right? But we got to the point where we lightened up our jigs, went a little smaller bodies and actually pulled, uh, you know, got our jigs to the bottom and then pulled downstream and pulled them off the bottom and got them going through the water horizontally, basically, instead of vertical and caught a lot more fish. So, yeah, that's something I think I, I talked about this last night. D -Day. I don't think enough guys on the river um, do enough things other than vertical jigging. I, I think that's something we get sucked into in Detroit. And look at when the water was dirtier and we had runoff. We had look at it, it's perfect. Vertical jigging's great, but as the water gets cleaner and the fish get smarter, and there's less fish moving, there's there's as many fish coming into the Detroit River as ever. I believe that that number is the same, but they come over a lot longer period of time now, so there isn't these this massive influx of fish, right? So. Um, these fish are in smaller spots, and sometimes casting gets you a better opportunity to get those fish as opposed to vertical jigging. Arlo says, I'm breaking a habit and going to fish a small lake tournament series. Looking forward to it. There you go. You know, one of the things I would like to do in the next year, I probably can't do it this year because of my schedule, but um, you know, one of the things I'd like to do in 2023 is I would like to get back into fishing um, little inland lake bass tournaments one night a week. You know, I fished a Tuesday night uh, bass fishing league a couple of years and loved it. Absolutely had a riot. Um, three hour tournaments one night a week loved it absolutely loved doing a little bit of bass fish i'd like to do that again you know give up uh an afternoon of guiding and, and come home and you know hop on a little 400 500 600 acre lake and do some bass fishing i, I would love to do that i miss i miss doing that and and again those things you know arlo you're gonna you know you're gonna learn things on a small lake because you're kind of working in micro now you're gonna learn things that are gonna let you become a better big lake fisherman if you're paying attention so it's, it's always good uh, Wayne says using lead core on Lake Huron, but can't talk myself into it, man. Lead core will change your life. I'm telling you. Um, uh, if you're a troller right now, one thing I would tell you to add right away um, is lead core. Now, I will tell you this, Wayne, if you're serious about that, and obviously I know you fish a lot. I, I, I know all that, but um, you might want to check out our uh, trolling boot camp. Um, it's on the pontoon. We take four guys. Uh, for four hours, we cover all the trolling stuff. We take you on the water and actually show you, let you physically do it all. Uh, and obviously, lead core is something that we cover. So uh, check out the trolling boot camp. Might be something we can get you on the on the pontoon with us with a group and maybe get you comfortable fishing lead core. So there you go. Uh, Jason says, for a first-time Detroit River caster, what is your go-to casting stuff? Great question, Jason. I like a little bit longer rod, uh, about six foot. Um, I still like a fairly stiff rod. Um, a stiff medium or a medium heavy, but I like a little bit softer tip. Whereas uh, my jigging rod is extra fast, only the top, you know, six, eight inches bends. For cast, I like I like a fast, so maybe, you know, the top 12 inches bends. So it's a little bit softer tip and a little bit longer rod, about a six footer. But again, a good quality rod, uh, medium to medium heavy with a little bit softer tip. Um, that'll get you going with casting. Um, you know, good quality fish, a good quality reel. Um, again, braided line. I, I, I cast with braided line, tied direct, same line I use for vertical jigging. But yeah, just a little bit longer rod than you use for vertical jigging. So there you go. Good question. Uh, Tom says, the teach and fishing tournament? Eh, we got some ideas. Robert says, use a snap weight yesterday with a P10 instead of using a deeper diver. Great success. That's something we're going to talk about. Uh, I think I've got that down for one of our May uh, Coffee Hour Pluses is talking about lure action and how sometimes a shallow diver with a weight getting gotten down deep is a better choice than actually fishing a deep diver that could actually get there without weight. We're going to talk about that. I think I've got that down uh, for early May, talk about lure action. So we're going to talk about that. Larry says one of his problems is putting together a game plan and not sticking to it, but it doesn't immediately produce fish. As Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and that's why you have to... That's why when you're building a game plan for the day, you have to have, you know, very, de very defined goals. I'm going to go here. This is where I should go first. This is what I want to see. If I don't see that, my next move is to do this. And if that doesn't work, my next move is to do this, right? And that shouldn't be, you know, I'm going to go fish 20 feet of water. And if I don't catch them here, I'm going to go to 20 feet somewhere else. It should be if I am going to fish 20, but I don't catch them in 20, my next move is to go to eight. If I don't catch them an eight, my next move is to go to 30. So you should have, you know, an A, B, and C plan uh, if that first plan doesn't work, right? Especially, there's nothing there's nothing more frustrating than putting in a bunch of work, getting your plan, 
driving out to your spot and there's no fish on your sonar. Like, well, oh, great, here we go. You know, that's usually a pretty, a pretty sinking feeling. But again, you have to have, okay, you have to be able to say they're not here. That's good. I can cross all this off. Where should they be now? Right? What and then usually the, the question is, okay, what did I miss in my planning? What did I not see? Why are these fish not here? What did I miss? That's kind of part of that whole planning thing there. So uh, Gary Sachs says he's getting excited about coming to Trolling Boot Camp, learn how to use fish lead corn dipsies. We cover all that. Ron says having a plan that I've put homework into during the week instead of trying to figure something out once I get to like that, Ron, I will tell you, I'm going to give you a like. That is something that will change the way you fish. Again, even if it doesn't work, at least you put the work in and you can understand why it doesn't work. And then you can kind of work from there. You can't, you can't make good decisions um, unless you have information. Right. Uh, I have a quote. I, I I probably could find it real quick in my phone, but um, I, a quote I saw on the Golf Channel. Right. Um, I can't remember what it was. Anyway, if you if I, anyway, it basically says if you can't measure something, right? You can't record it. If you can't record it and measure it and record it, you can't fix it. So you, you have to have data that says I did this and this didn't work. And I did this and this worked before you can start making adjustments. So um, having a good plan, even if it doesn't work, is actually beneficial uh, in the long run. And I, you know, one of the things I tell you, I, one of the things that kind of changed my attitude about fishing is I remember reading, uh, I've got a, a, a book that uh, Roland Martin wrote about bass fishing, obviously, but um, you know, he was talking about pattern fishing and putting, a, you know, making decisions on the water. And he said nine times out of 10, his first decision of the day, his first choice of where to go, or his first decision is wrong. Well, I'm like, well, she's if Roland Martin can miss nine times out of 10, I guess that's not a bad thing for me to miss nine times out of 10, right? So um, having that plan A, plan B, plan C, because you are going to, your first plan is not going to work all the time. How do you adjust to that, right? That's, that's, that's a big deal, so. All right, good conversation, guys. Let's get it wrapped up. Uh, again, please head over to teachingfishing.com. Click on the public lounge. Lots of really, really, really cool um, stuff there, especially our foundation series. Uh, Tom says, convincing my friend to use all the electronics he has purchased to best read the water. That's important, right? Uh, head over to the public uh, lounge. Lots of stuff there. Check out the Teach Fishing Anglers Club. If you are not a member yet, check that out. Lots of cool stuff there, monthly content. Uh, I think we're going to drop uh, an Ali seminar pretty quick. I think if it hasn't already dropped, I think it already did drop, actually. Uh, Ali gave us an extra seminar this uh, month, uh, Time in the Walleye Spawn. I hope you watched that. That was That's really cool with what's happening right now. Um, DVD to stream, check that out. Uh, we've got the DVD library there that you can watch. Trolling Boot Camp, we've got our Trolling Boot Camp dates set. Our first two dates are actually sold out, so... Uh, I think we have five dates and our first two are sold out. I know there's one or two guys, um, uh, one or two guys in each of the other three sessions. So um, ready to go. We're going to get dates up for um, uh, Button the Boat. If you want Chris on your boat, we're going to get some dates up for that. We've got some dates and some pricing for that. We'll have that up here pretty quick. Okay. All right, guys, thank you for joining me tonight. I hope you guys had a good time. Again, if you didn't get it, go to teachafishing.com, click on the Coffee Hour Plus box, get the uh, study material for tonight so you can kind of keep notes and be ready to go. All right, thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. We'll see you guys back here uh, next week. We'll be here on Monday for Coffee Hour Plus. Appreciate your time. We'll see you back here next time.